Hello, I'm Pastor Aaron. And normally I upload my sermons to the channel so that you can be edified by God's word. Uh, but I also enjoy talking to other pastors and to connect with them. I enjoy exchanges of ideas. I enjoy appreciating similarities and discussing differences. And so I thought I would record and share some conversations I have with other pastors from different Christian traditions. And the goal is to develop mutual respect and understanding and appreciation for different threads in the body of Christ. So I hope you enjoy these episodes and can appreciate them. May God bless you. Well, Jonathan, why don't you start us off with uh, telling telling us your name, something about your family and your ministry. All right. Yeah, well, my name is Jonathan Deku, and uh, my better half is Sherry. We've been married for a long, long time. Yeah, almost almost 50 years. I can't even believe it. Not quite. We got a little way to go yet, but we'll, wow. we're going to make it. Um, I'm, I just turned 65 on Sunday, so okay. I don't, I don't feel like it, but <laughs> whatever, I, at least what I imagined it would be like anyway, but I'm, uh, yeah, but we've had, we've got five kids. They're all adults, uh, a daughter, and then four boys, our oldest, uh, Carissa, she's married. They have three, she has three kids. And then, uh, my the four boys, our second son, he's married, and our last son is married, and our second son, he and Elisha, they have a a beautiful little girl, and uh, she's going to be five this year. I can't believe that. And then uh, it's just really awesome to be a grandparent. We should have started with that. <laughs> it's a lot more fun. Uh, yeah. But yeah, and then I am the pastor. Currently, I'm serving at Whitneyville Bible Church, which is on the southeast side of Grand Rapids. Uh, our mailing address is Alto, but the location most people perceive is Caledonia. So we're uh, roughly at the intersection of 84th and Whitneyville Avenue over here on the southeast side of Grand Rapids. Uh, a wonderful church, although it's part of the Bible Church Association. Okay. It is very, very similar in polity and doctrine than as a Baptist church. And my, my, my past, my history has been primarily in Baptist churches. The IFCA that we belong to, it's not a denomination, it's just an association of churches. Okay. We have quite a few Baptist churches in our association, actually, uh, but primarily the Bible church label would be... It'd be very similar. Folks from a Baptist church would feel right at home in our church and vice versa. So Yeah. I didn't know you were IFCA. That's interesting. Um, mm -hmm. When I last knew you, you were GARB, if I'm General Association of Regular Baptists. Is that correct? That is correct. Yeah. When I was in Allendale, when we um, had association, when uh, when we were close together there, that was a JRBC church. And it still is. Allendale Baptist Church still is. It's a good church. And uh, uh, Mark Green's doing a great job as pastor there, and the church is growing, and uh, really, really happy to see what God's doing at that church. Okay. Well, tell me something about the IFCA. Is that Independent Fundamentalist Churches of America? Is that what that stands yeah, for? Yeah, yeah, that's pretty close. Yeah, and the, 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 the association is a group of independent churches that are combining their energies for uh, for several purposes, primarily evangelism. Uh, we link arms to do evangelistic work and to support mission agencies and missionaries. And then also uh, education. We have a number of educational institutions that we work together with all across the country and even some internationally. I read and, like Bible colleges. Yes, and seminaries, both. Yeah, okay. Bible colleges and seminaries. And then uh, <clears throat> the association provides resources to the churches. Some of the churches, the smaller churches, uh, might need help with staffing or uh, interim pastoral support and that kind of thing. And uh, 
the IFCA as an association will offer any assistance that folks would like. Uh, and then we also have a benevolent arm that will help uh, not only our own our own sister churches, but in situations, you know, um, emergency situations and catastrophes that might occur uh, around the world, we we try to provide benevolent here. So that's that's a overview, big big overview. There's a lot of different things that the IFC does, but that's a good overview of who we okay. are. Okay, is there accountability there too? Um, if a pastor were to, you know, go off the rails theologically, is there some measure of accountability for something like that? Related to that particular piece, yes. Uh, different than a denomination, the IFCA as an organization has no specific authority over any individual church. Okay. So that would be one of the distinctives about our particular association that would be similar actually to the JRBC. The JRBC is also not a denominational group, but um, associational. Okay. And so uh, each year we do have to, as churches and then individually, so for example, I'm an individual member of the IFCA and our churches, our church particularly is also a member of the IFCA. So any member churches or individual members on an annual basis, do have to uh, sign off doctrinally. And uh, so we're held accountable at that level uh, for that. Other than that, it would be all at a local level. Okay. All right. But a congregation or a pastor could probably be removed if if needed. Yes. Yeah, so like, for example, in our, our church constitution, there are provisions for that. Uh, okay. You know, if if like you say, if I went off the rail theologic thought of the rails theologically, there would be recourse that the local congregation, local fellowship right. would have. Okay, well, very good. But your your background is is Baptist and 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 that, so I'm gonna maybe talk more along those lines. Um, if I didn't know anything about what it meant to be a Baptist, how would you how would you describe the Baptist? emphasis uh in distinction to other christian traditions i think baptists are recognized for a number of things and one of the things that baptists like to do is use the word baptists to okay. kind of identify those things so the first one would be you know if you take the word baptists and work it out as an acrostic it would work something like this the b would stand for biblical authority the uh, baptist as a historic group, and particularly like in our case, we believe that the Bible is a sole authority for everything in life and for the ministry of the church and for our teaching and preaching. Uh, there are some unique aspects of that. We can get into this a little later when we talk about some distinctives about, you know, interpretive approaches and things like that. But the Bible is our authority for all that we are and all that we do. So that would be one thing. Another thing that would be particularly noteworthy of uh, Baptists, if you want to use that A, uh, would be uh, autonomy, church autonomy. Uh, kind of alluded to that already, actually. Um, Baptist churches typically uh, are uh, have a had a, have an autonomy apart from any other uh, organization or individual. So. For example, the Baptist churches would say that the pastoral leadership is directly accountable to the Lord Jesus Christ, and that that's where the authority for the church comes from, and the autonomy of the local church is something that's held in high value. The P would stand for priesthood of the believer. Uh, we hold very highly, and you know, I understand, Aaron, you would agree with that, that uh, every believer has priestly access to the Lord Jesus and to our Heavenly Father, but also every believer has a responsibility to function as a priest. In other words, the word priest, I know you know this, Aaron, the word priest means bridge. So every believer has a responsibility to act on behalf of the people in communicating and speaking back to God, and at times speaking for God to the people. 
uh, sort of a kind of an intercessory intercessory role, but different than, uh, for example, again, not to throw stones at anybody, but different than the role that we would see, like in the Roman Catholic Church, the way the priest functions there, that would be different. And obviously, we believe that every believer, every genuine Christ follower is a priest. Uh, the first T would, uh, you can't be a good Baptist and not talk about offerings. Uh, so we would use this, that first T would refer to tithing. It's a okay. it's an emphasis that we like to make uh, to help people learn the principle of personal stewardship in the financial area. Uh, but it also opens up the teaching of stewardship in all areas of life. Uh, about a, uh, about two years ago, I did a series of messages on that very principle in our church, teaching what I called guardianship rather than using the word stewardship, which is a word a lot of people today wouldn't necessarily identify with. The idea of being a guardian over our time, over our different talents and abilities, and over our financial resources, and over our relationships. And so I would use that T today to talk about all of that that we have a sense of stewardship and guardianship in all those areas. And then in our case, that I, B-A-P-T-I, would be immersion baptism. And we can maybe talk a little bit about that more in a little bit. But we believe um, and practice baptism by immersion, that is submerging somebody underwater. And, um, uh, you know, we have... We have our reasons for for that practice and for why we believe that. We like I say we can talk about that, but that would obviously the whole name Baptist suggests that, right? Yes. And then uh, the S B A P T I S would be what we call spirit led living. Uh, the only way possible to live the Christian life is by God's power at work in us, and. Uh, when you think of the work of redemption and reconciliation, you can't avoid the word sanctification. And the way that I like to explain sanctification is it is it is the, the growing in the capacity to practice righteousness. This is the direct effect of God's word in our lives, is the direct effect of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And as we trust and lean into the Holy Spirit and the word of God, uh, that spirit-led living can be, be accomplished. Uh, the second T is telling others about Christ. Uh, that would be, we have a heavy emphasis on evangelism. Uh, my personal life and ministry is, is deeply committed to the work of evangelism. And it's something that we try to elevate within our church family. And uh, most, certainly not all, but most Baptist churches would have a high stress on teaching how to share your faith, and then actually doing that, actually sharing your faith with other people. And then the final S, B-A-P-T-I-S-T-S, -S, would stand for what we call saved church membership. And the idea of that, again, a little bit of a distinctive way of putting it, mm -hmm. is that the the practically the way that would work out that a person is saved, they come to faith first, then they would be baptized, then that would all precede membership. And that would be just, again, that's a distinctive emphasis and focus that Baptists would have. So for somebody who doesn't know a Baptist church, I think those, those different points would be a good overview and a good introduction to what it would mean to think baptistically yeah <laughs> yes no that's uh that that uh fits with everything that i understand about about baptists as well um one uh one thing that that you did mention uh, about telling others about christ that that is something that um it seems like in my experience baptists do very well and have done well um in compared to other Christian traditions is that they, they do evangelism really well. What other strengths would you say um, about, about Baptists? I think the principle of biblical authority is probably the most important one. 
um, maybe bridging into some of the things that we share in the faith. But, uh, you know, for example, <clears throat> the Baptist tradition grows out of the Reformation era, too. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we would, you know, wholeheartedly embrace what are often referred to as the five sola statements. In fact, I did a, it was last year, I did a, I did a whole series on the sola statements in our church. And uh, the emphasis on the authority and the sufficiency of scripture is something that I think uh, in our heritage has been something that we've held up high. And personally, I, I feel like I really don't have anything else to share with anybody. You know, my ideas and my thoughts and my perspectives, my opinions, my experience, none of that is of value unless it is in conformity with the authority and the Word of God. And so the authority of Scripture is probably the paramount uh, emphasis, I guess I would say, that uh, is important, is important to think of. Okay. Yeah, I, uh, I, I would agree. I would agree. Mm -hmm. The people that I know that are that are Baptists, they're they're going back to the Bible a lot in in their conversations and their formation of their beliefs and their practices and and such. Uh, yeah, I would definitely agree that that is a, a strength. Um, what what would you say are are Baptist weaknesses? I think. <laughs> I think sometimes, and this is probably not just true of Baptists, okay, but I think it's easy to become isolated. Mm. Uh, in other words, to think that we're it, you know, we're all there is to the body of Christ, and that just simply is not true. That just simply is not true, and it's a very dangerous attitude to have, and uh, you know, we often look at, uh, for example, passages like 1 Corinthians 11, 12, 13, 14 on the whole body, and uh, we tend to apply that very in a very local way, I think. Uh, hey, brothers and sisters here at Whitneyville Bible Church, you know, we're a body, but we're also part of the, the universal church. And... Uh, <laughs> Last year, I also did a series on the Apostles' Creed, which was a little unusual for a Baptist church or <laughs> an independent church like ours. Hey, but, I'm, I'm excited. <laughs> but the whole point of doing that was to identify to our folks, these are historic, biblical truths that the true church, the true Christian church, if you're a Christian church, these are things you, I, I, I'd go so far as to say you have to believe. Uh, they're not optional. They're not. It's not a smorgasbord. I like this, but I don't care for that. No, uh, these are all what the Apostles' Creed represents is essential doctrine. And uh, when we <laughs> when we talked about the Holy Catholic Church, I had a couple of folks who were like, "What are you, the Catholic Church?" You know, and I'm like, "No, no, no, no. Don't get, don't get." I didn't say Roman Catholic Church. There you go. I said the Holy Catholic Church and had explained to folks that the word Catholic simply means universal. Yep. It means there's more to the body of Christ than our little corner on the planet. All right. And so that's true denominationally. I think it's really, really important for us to think of the things that unite us, the things that we, you know, even go so far as to use the word disagree on or don't see eye to eye on. As long as there are secondary issues, I'm more than willing to have the conversations. I refuse to argue with my brothers and sisters about theological things. I'm happy to discuss them, but if the thing if the thing heats up to becoming argumentative, I I step away from that. I will not do that. Yeah. But it's important to remember that the church is bigger than me. It's bigger than yes. us locally. And part of the part of the body concept extends beyond my local church to the universal church. And so there are parts of the body that may be a little bit different perspective on certain theological issues that are again, like I'd call secondary, not that they're not important, but they're not salvific. Yeah. And it's okay for us to disagree about those things and have different practices in certain areas. But 
that's part of the body concept that Paul's talking about there in First Corinthians. And we need to we need to make sure. So it's easy for any of us, and it's true of Baptists, and I think it's true for everybody, but we can be have a very isolationist mentality, and that's not good. Yeah. Yeah, and I think you're right. That's not unique to Baptists, but um, that might be one that you've encountered um, in your particular experience. Um, yeah, now on the, the concept of the universal universal church and having being part of a broader body, um, this would be part of why I think in my case, the Christian Reformed Church that we have a, a denomination in the more historical sense, you know, not an association or a convention, but but we kind of all belong together. Um, how do how do Baptists um, how do Baptists understand that in a different way? Which exactly? What do you mean? Understand precisely what? what so you're asking about the body of the body of Christ is a is a is a you know much larger than than just the local congregation. Um, and in that way we belong together. Um, and so we do, we do work together. We do ministry together. We hold one another accountable and, and there's more of a denominational structure there. Um, right. Okay. I think I follow what you're saying. So for example, uh, again, Baptists being tending to be very autonomous and independent, uh, and as you understand, I know you know, Aaron, there's like a wide variety of Baptists, you know, it, there's not any one caricature Indeed. of Baptists we want to paint. Some of them are a little bit more uh, militant in their identity than others. And there would be even some who would think that, you know, we're it and would be very separatistic and uh, to me... Uh, and again, I'm only speaking for myself here, Aaron. Yeah, I would, I would, I am not willing to separate from other brothers and sisters who are uh, together on the essentials of the Christian faith. I, I just, I just can't do that. And so my my fellowship is beyond my association or my local church. I, uh, I'm very, very ready to do that. There are groups or individuals that I, I guess I might put it this way that I wouldn't associate with if, if I can put it that way, yep. because from my perspective, they aren't holding to the biblical essentials of Christianity. And, uh, uh, and I think that that, I think like Paul says in first Corinthians 11, the distinctions are something that he says, I'm, I'm glad for those. They're, they're there for a reason. And they actually will reveal who is true to the word of the Lord and who is true to Christ. And I certainly think that in American culture, that distinction is, is really an important thing to, to state because we have a lot of cultural issues that are bringing pressure on the church to water down or to uh, give way to uh, on what I would say, not even, I would only want to use the word historic, because that's true, but or I would just, again, go back to the principle of biblical authority and sufficiency and say that the Bible's clear on these things. I think we can agree that the Bible's clear on it, whether you like it or not, or whether you personally agree with it or, or accept it or not. That's, I respect your right to do that, but let's agree that the Bible's not ambiguous on some of these things. And so we have to stand on the authority of scripture. That's not always popular. It's not always comfortable. But I think more and more we're going to see the need for uh, the Western Church to do that. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, there was a time when when um, the Christian Church was very integrated in society, respected in society, and and those days are increasingly over. Um, yeah, and they definitely so are. Mm -hmm. we are going to be standing out like like sore thumbs um, in in society, which is what it was in the early church too. So this is nothing, this is nothing new. Um, <laughs> no. But uh, yeah. So just general stuff that we agree with, we could probably go on for quite a while. Um, oh, you my goodness, talked yeah. about uh, essentials of the faith. Um, 
I think you and I would agree on the biblical authority, the, the Bible being is the final authority for all things, faith and life. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm glad that you preached through the apostles creed. Uh, <laughs> the Christian reformed church is a creedal confessional, uh, denomination. So I'm, I'm, I'm all about that. I think that's great. Um, but the triune God, we would agree on, um, salvation only in Christ, his virgin birth, his life, his death, his resurrection, ascension. We would agree on all of that. The five solas of the Reformation, we we would agree on that. Um, grace alone, faith alone, Christ alone, Scripture alone, uh, to the glory of God alone. That's right. Amen. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Um, you mentioned priesthood of believers. Uh, we would agree on that as well. Um, you mentioned spirit led led living. You know, in a process of sanctification, we we would agree there and telling others about, about Christ. I think that the Baptists have probably done it better than the reform people have, have done it historically, but, uh, but we both would agree that that is an important, important thing. Um, that, that was just the kind of a, a little list of things that I, I think we, we agree on to anything that you would add to that list. Well, I would just really emphasize that, when you think of the whole uh, process of redemption and reconciliation of God buying us out, the way I like to call it, buying us out of the slave market of sin and restoring us to have peace with God, to have then the peace of God so that we can be at peace with ourselves and with God, but also at peace with one another that whole process is is such an important thing to emphasize. And the concepts of justification, uh, I'm teaching a young adult Bible study, and we're actually studying through the book of Romans right now. Right. And uh, it was wonderful in chapters three and four, especially, to introduce some of our young adults to the principles of justification and sanctification, ways that they really hadn't learned or known before. And it was just really great to see the lights come on, to understand the way I like to explain justification to them. I said, justification, of course, is God uh, saving us from and delivering us from the penalty of our sin and putting us into a position of holiness is the way that I describe it. That's not original with me. And then sanctification, though, is being delivered and saved from the power and the control of our sin into the practice of holiness. So justification is a positional thing. It's a legal thing. But sanctification is that process of justification working itself out day to day. And for a true believer, for somebody who's really in relationship with Christ, they should be able over time to be able to look and see that sanctifying work take place. And like I warned the young people, if you don't see that happening, you might want to get back to square one. And then, of course, we look forward to the great day. And this would be something that we would agree on uh, in a very broad way, at least, is uh, the a future reign of Jesus Christ and how all that plays out. We would probably have some differences of uh, interpretation on Scripture, but I know that we agree that Jesus Christ is King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and someday, this old earth and the entire universe is going to be destroyed, and he's going to recreate the whole thing. And he, for those of us who are walking in faith and obedience to the Lord Jesus, we're going to be glorified someday. And that means that we will be free from the very presence of sin in our lives, and we will experience the perfection of his holiness. I tell you what, I don't, I don't think I can think of anything more wonderful than that. I think of all the wonderful blessings of the eternal state and all the goodness that that is, but the idea of being free from the presence of sin and perfected in holiness, I cannot wait for that. And so I think I think those those emphases that we we make theologically are so important and they have practical ramifications in our daily experience. And um, a lot of believers don't walk in all that truth. And so it's important to help them do it. Indeed. 
I just uh, so it's such a pivotal thing to to see that your own problems and the world's problems are are not what they appear on the surface. It's really sin. Um, mm-hmm. Everything else is a manifestation of that that real problem and so we can work on those symptoms all we want but the real problem is going to be there until until we uh surrender to jesus christ and embrace his gospel and his truths um and start following him um it uh it changes the way that you you look at everything to and you know what you know what aaron it is really the motivating what i just described is what motivates the work of evangelism when you realize that God has called us, you remember, you know, I know you know the Great Commission in the end of Matthew 28. Yeah. And uh, Jesus has told us, he told his 12 disciples, and he's uh, by implication told all of his disciples of all time, you need to go and go to all people and share the good news of the gospel, teach them everything that I've taught you. And to teach people that they have an opportunity to not have to suffer the consequences of sin, not only in their present experience, but also eternally, and to teach the reality of eternal punishment and separation from God and anything that's good in the eternal lake of fire. And again, I know that's a doctrine that's fallen on hard times, even among so-called Christian churches. Yep. But again, this is one of those those principles in Scripture that's crystal clear. I mean, we don't we don't have to wonder if the Bible teaches it. It does. Again, you don't I respect somebody's right to not want to accept it, but it is there. Yep. And so when we have the, the opportunity to encourage people to step forward in faith, to call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and to be saved from their sin, to say see that to see that their soul can be saved for eternity, and then to experience what Jesus called in John 10 10, the abundant life, to experience the outworking of the truths of scripture and the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives, so that day by day we're seeing sin losing its control and losing its power in our lives, and that the Holy Spirit is dominating our thinking and our responses and our words and our attitudes and all of that, and to have the hope of glory. On all of that, that's what should motivate the work of evangelism and help people to come across the bridge, <laughs> yes, you know, to God, yes. And and would, um, would you and I also agree on, on, um, on uh, predestination, election, and and those sorts of things, or would we have some differences there? Um, I think for the most part we would probably agree um one of the areas where we would probably you know uh i teasingly refer to myself as a four-point calvinist and uh and you probably know where i'm headed with this oh go for it but um the principle of uh limited atonement would probably be something where you and i might disagree okay and again i i I get it i understand where different guys uh come from on that principle um i think some of it might be looking at two sides of the same coin perhaps uh and we don't probably need to get into a big theological conversation about that today but that would probably be one area where we would we have a little bit of disagreement okay uh but again ultimately you know we're 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 not really disagreeing in a way i mean we are you know we are aiming at the same thing and you know whether somebody holds to limited atonement or not isn't a salvific concern i think it's a great conversation i love having robust discussions with guys about it and uh we have guys even within our uh baptist camp who would be five point calvinists i mean they're you know they're very very reformed Baptist, you know, if I can, and you know that as an actual group of Baptists. Yeah. So uh, again, I love the discussion, but it's not something I'm willing to, you know, put them up, you know, I'm like, right, right, right. We're not going to go there. Yeah. And that's why, and that's why I have this. I just, um, just the exchange of ideas, you know? Yes, Um, absolutely. Totally. That's, uh, that's what my idea is here. Um, so 
um tell me tell me why um let's let's get into just some some distinctives here again not that this means that one of us isn't saved or anything like that oh. um but uh explain to me uh why baptists uh only do um adult or believer baptism right so for example in our uh our understanding uh about uh immersion baptism the the word itself means that it means to immerse the word the and again, Aaron, I know you know this, but for the sake of those who are watching this later, the English word baptism is a transliteration of a Greek word, baptizo. And the word means to submerge or uh, to plunge under uh, water. And so uh, the immersion part of our baptism practice comes from that. The principle of believer's baptism, as you referred to it, is a good way to put it. We believe that um, uh, all of the examples that you read of in Scripture, particularly in the New Testament, are believer baptism experiences. In other words, somebody came to faith in Christ, and then they were baptized. I personally like to encourage the baptism event as an act of obedience to Christ's command to be baptized as quickly after somebody comes to faith as possible. Uh, and so our concept is that... that uh, Baptism is something for a believer to do as an act of faithful obedience to Christ. And uh, uh, a similar, although not identical, parallel to the pedo-baptism of your tradition, for example, would be what we would call dedication or child dedication. And uh, uh, when folks have a, have, a, have a child, have a baby, we encourage them to present that child before the church to the Lord, that they're making a statement in the fellowship of believers, in the accountability of the body, to say we are we are bringing this child uh, to present him as to the Lord, sort of like what uh, you know what Hannah did. I'm giving my I'm giving my son to the Lord, and obviously it plays out differently than Hannah, but the idea is still I'm dedicating my child to the Lord and to his purposes in their life. And obviously we're saying to the whole church community, we want to gather around this family and we want to encourage them to know the word of God and to train their child. And one of the things we're trying to do in our particular church, Aaron, is to bring the principles of discipleship and the practice of a discipleship as closely to the local home as possible. That the dad would be the high priest of his home, that the dad would be the one to model Christianity within the home, and that the that the 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 church, as good reformers teach it, is a is a mini vision, a mini picture, although not that many if you think of it in a particular way. But it's a it's a small society. It's a it's a small form of government. It's a small version of the church, and that's a dad's responsibility in the home to do that. So um, we make a distinction between those two things: the child. Child uh, dedication is something the parents are doing for the sake of the child and making a commitment to the body of Christ. But the act of baptism is an act of faith and obedience. That's what we. That's how we interpret the the incidence of baptism in Scripture. Yeah. Now, in in the Reformed tradition, we call baptism and the Lord's Supper sacraments. Uh, Baptists usually refer to them as ordinances. Um, we in the reformed tradition we'd call them a, a means of grace not that they are not that they are saving saving us but that they there is there is a connection between the sign and the thing the thing signified and such um would we have a similar view of the lord's supper or or not so much would you say i think actually the the baptist reaction if i can put it that way to the word ordinance has more to do with the Roman Catholic Church than it does with any of our uh, Protestant brothers and sisters. So okay. as you know, the Roman Catholic Church has a different view toward the, as they use the term, sacrament of baptism or the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. They would contend that they are salvific or have salvific grace connected to them. 
And we would categorically ref refute that. We would say that that's just that it's not scripturally sound at all. So I think one of the things that some of my uh, Baptist brethren uh, react to is the use of the word ordinance and the concept, like you just described, they are a, they are a means of grace, not salvific grace. And I personally, and again, there would be those within the independent movement that would disagree with what I'm going to say. Okay. But for me personally, I I believe that there is grace within those uh, those as we use the term those ordinances. Uh, I don't know how else to describe when we do the Lord's Supper, one of the things that we're called upon to do is to go before the Lord Jesus, to keep a short account with him, to confess sin, to make sure that our relationships with our brothers and sisters are right. I don't know how any of that's possible short of grace. Mm -hmm. And in the, in the issue of baptism, you're making a statement uh, in our our practice of baptism, when somebody is immersed in the water, the way that we teach that is that you're being you're dying to the old life, you're dying to the self life, and you're being raised in the newness of life that comes of becoming a new creation in Jesus Christ. So it's a symbol, it's a picture, it's a picture of grace. But then there's also the grace of testimony in the act. In other words, we try to encourage those who are being baptized, as we will later this summer, to invite, invite unsaved family, invite unsaved friends and schoolmates and, and work associates to your event. Because what you're doing is you're giving a testimony that, number one, I belong to Jesus Christ, and number two, I'm being accountable now to a wider circle of people than just me and the Lord Jesus. I'm making a commitment to Christ, but I'm also proclaiming my relationship with Christ to my fellow brothers and sisters, to my immediate family, and to anybody else who's witnessing this. And it becomes a, a means of grace in the sense, when you think of the term, the meaning of the word, the way that I like to explain grace, Aaron, is that grace is me not getting, excuse me, try that again, grace is me getting what I don't deserve, but desperately need and can't do for myself. Grace is me getting what I don't deserve, but desperately need and cannot do for myself. Mercy, on the other hand, is me not getting what I do deserve. And so that, obviously, that aspect of grace is salvific. But there's sustaining grace and that God gives us to, like we talked about sanctification. That's an aspect of grace. Do I deserve God to give me his, his sanctifying work? Uh, no, I don't. Right. Do, I, do I deserve to receive the glory, glorious inheritance? I mean, no, I don't. But the exactly. ability to live the life is all about grace. So I don't think you and I would probably disagree on those applications of the term. I think we would agree. I think we would agree that there's nothing salvific in baptism, whether it's pedo baptism or believer's baptism. There's nothing salvific in and of that event. And partaking in the Lord's Supper or communion, whichever term you use, uh, and again, our tradition tends to avoid the term communion, again, because of the connotations of the Roman Church. Uh, but there's nothing salvific in it, although it points to the saving work of Christ. Yes. So they're both symbols. They're both pictures. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um. The uh, one 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 part that uh, that uh, we've talked about before that I would like to hear again is uh, about um, dispensationalism and versus covenant theology. Um, the way that I. I describe it. You tell me, you tell me if this falls short is that a dispensationalist will look at the historic, uh, historic re redemption of the Lord and kind of divide it up and say, there was these commands and regulations for this, this section of, of time. Then there were different ones for this one, different ones for this one. 
whereas covenant theology would see it as layers. So there's there is a covenant here. And we were walking on that for a while. Now there's a new layer. Now we're walking on this one. And so they build on each other. It, they don't end. They build on each other. Um, I think you just if, described dispensation, dispensationalism beautifully just with what you just said. Okay. I was wondering I, if that's a fair description <laughs> or not. <laughs> you know, I, mean, just, I think, I think again, some of it might be semantical. I think there are theological differences, certainly. And we can talk about that a little bit if you want. But the the concept of dispensationalism uh, comes from a couple of uh, a couple of uh, points of consideration. So, for example, uh, the method of interpretation that we try to use throughout all of Scripture is what I like to call the literal, historical, grammatical, and contextual approach to Scripture. And we try to utilize that method of interpretation across the board in any part of Scripture. So if you're dealing with a narrative, part of the Old Testament, or the Gospel record, you would use that method of interpretation. If you're going to look at uh, some of the poetic books of the Old Testament, you would still use that method of, of interpretation. If you're looking at Paul's letters, you would still use that method of interpretation. And that would be similar to the treatment of, of prophecy. We would use the same method. And so by virtue of that method, you come to a, a set of conclusions that would be different, say, from somebody who would particularly take the uh, matters of uh, eschatology, for example, and have a more uh, uh, metaphorical or allegorical approach to those. They're going to arrive at some different conclusions. So the first thing that I would say dispensational is dispensationalism is a result of that system of interpretation. It also comes from a from a history, a view of the history of of humanity and God's interaction with humanity. So, for example, the way that God dealt with Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden is different from the way that He's dealing with the church today. Uh, <clears throat> the era, <clears throat> excuse me, between uh, Adam and Eve and let's say coming up to Abraham. God was dealing with uh, people based on a certain amount of revelation that he had shared with them, and he expected them to respond in faith to that. Righteousness is always by faith, and you can only respond to what you know. So there was a certain amount of information that God shared up to that point. By the time Abraham shows up, and you already referred to this, there's a covenant agreement that God makes with Abraham that has several different components to it, a whole nother set of information, a whole nother, another uh, set of expectations that go along with that. It's another dispensation, another era, another uh, period of time. And then you move forward as the Mosaic Covenant is given. It fulfills, if you want to think of it this way, it fulfills the spiritual conditions of the Abrahamic co Covenant. And uh, it is a stopgap up until the time of Christ coming of Christ. And so for that whole period between uh, Moses and the time of Christ, you have yet a whole nother set of expectations, a whole nother set of revelation that God has given. And then you come to the, the period of Christ, and now, like the book of Hebrews makes you know, eminently clear, the Lord Jesus has fulfilled every expectation of the Mosaic Covenant, and then some. And the new covenant that he initiates is completely uh, superior in every way to the person of Moses. It's superior to the uh, sacrificial system of the Old Testament. It's superior to the priestly line of Aaron, and it is uh, and the Levitical line. And so now we're in a period here where. The new covenant is, like you were referring to, I think that's part of one of the layers that you're referring to. Uh, now we're in that period of time. And so what we're seeing is the series of the progress of revelation coming. God didn't give us all 66 books of the Bible at one time. It unfolded. And dispensationalism is recognizing those different epochs, those different eras, those different dispensation. And with each 
dispensation, there was a certain amount of revelation that the that humanity was being held accountable for. And as we progress, more and more of that revelation has been made known to us. And eventually, after this current age, we will move into the glorified state someday, and that will be the final dispensation. That will be the, the eternal state where all, all, all things are made new. So that come that's the way that's a that's a very high view uh, of dispensationalism. I, I hope that answers the answers yeah, the question no, it for does. you. And there's no way we'll be able to cover all of the all of this in just one one sitting here. My my understanding also is that maybe the the most noticeable difference between a dispensational view and a covenant view is that. Um, in a dispensational view, Israel and the church are two separate peoples of God, whereas in a covenant view, there's one people of God throughout the historical uh, redemption. Of, is that? Would you agree with that? No, I would or? agree with you. No, I would agree with that. For example, so this this one of the one of the areas of distinction for us and against, uh, for example, the Reformed tradition that you represent would be in the areas of ecclesiology and eschatology. So, for example, like you just alluded to, we would see a distinction between the nation of Israel and the promises of God to the nation of Israel, and we would see a distinction in this dispensation, the church age, uh, that's, that's separate. And just for those who are watching... Uh, we would use Romans 9, 10, and 11, for example, as a as a way to help see this principle. There are other passages of Scripture, of course, that we would refer to, but those would be the, the, the most compact way to look at it. Romans chapter 9 explains the historical, if I can put it this way, predicament of the nation of Israel, uh, that although they had been the benefactors of God's law, and uh, being the chosen people, they did not act responsibly ultimately in that res in that role. One of their uh, responsibilities was to keep covenant with God. And if you know the history of Israel, you know that that was something they didn't do particularly well. I'm not sure how well we would do it if we were in their place, but that's another subject perhaps. Uh, then uh, the other component of that is that... Uh, the Lord then says, now for a time, as you read in ch chapter 10 of Romans, now I'm going to, uh, since the nation of Israel has not been faithful in this regard, I'm going to move to the Gentiles. One of the things the nation of Israel was supposed to do was be, to be, talk about evangelism, to be a witness to the nations. They did not fulfill that responsibility that they had. And uh, the prophets you know, categorically condemn them for for not doing that. So God is saying, okay, Israel, I'm going to set you guys aside for a period of time, and now I'm going to work directly with the Gentiles. I'm going to work direct, directly with the non-Jews. And that's what the church age is about. And Romans 10 explains that. Romans 11 then explains and warns the Gentiles, now be careful, be careful, don't get a high horse, get up on a high horse here, that God has a future for the nation of Israel. And this is where you and I would probably have a little bit of a disagreement. But we see that as a distinct difference from the church age. And eschatologically, again, because of our method of interpretation, we see that the Lord Jesus will at some point come and claim the church and pull the church uh, from the world and begin directly interacting with the nation of Israel again. Uh, and again, there would be there would even be Baptists who would nuance this you know what we refer to the rapture for example they would you know where that occurs and when and all that but again the idea is that whenever it occurs there comes a period of time uh the the, the seven-year tribulation period that's described in the book of revelation and alluded to in, in daniel chapter 9 that period of time is when god will again will again directly interact with the nation of Israel. And then in what we our understanding again of Revelation as it teaches about the millennium, Jesus will come to the earth 
and will bring with him the saints of glory, which will, in my understanding, include Old Testament saints and church age saints. Uh, so there will be a unification at that point of all believers, and they will rule and reign with Christ during that thousand years. And Christ's kingdom will be set up in Israel, in, and it will have its federal head in Jerusalem. And he will rule the entire world. And then at the end of that thousand-year period, there will be an uprising again against the Lord Jesus, which he will quell with just a word of his mouth. And then judgment will destroy the whole universe, and a new heaven and earth will be made. And then we will move into eternal in, into the eternal state. It is in the eternal state that we see the complete unification of all saints, whether they're Old Testament Jewish saints, church age saints, or whatever. So that would be the that would be again that's a superficial overview of it, but that's how we would we would tend to interpret things. Yes. Okay. Um, one verse that uh, that uh, is kind of pivotal in my understanding of reading the Old Testament as well as the New. I'm just interested in how if if, if we look at this verse differently, it's as if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring and heirs according to the promise um would you would you understand that verse differently than than me then i don't think so um my understanding of that the application the interpretation and application of that concept you know abraham predated the the law he predated the mosaic law so the principle here that uh, scripture is talking about is the way the way we read it in the New Testament it's repeated several times that the righteous will live by faith. And so Abraham is described in several several different New Testament passages on that basis in Romans and Galatians, uh, James, there are other other passages that all refer to that principle that, Abraham is the example of righteousness that leads to faith. The righteous will live by their faith. And so we are the children of Abraham by that principle. We become the children of Abraham by being people of faith, living righteously and be uh, achieving righteousness through faith in Jesus Christ. Well, I know you would, you would agree with this. All of the Old Testament era was pointing us toward, toward Jesus, pointing us toward the cross and toward the resurrection. And now we're looking back on that, but all people of all ages are children of Abraham in that respect, that we're okay. people who uh, find righteousness because of faith. So that's, that's, that's true of any believer, whether you're Old Testament saint, New Testament saint, nation of Israel, part of the church, that principle is God's principle for righteousness being, uh, being given to anybody. Okay, so we might we might uh, we might have some agreement on that then. It, yeah, I think new, we would nuance it differently a little bit. Sure, but I think the principle of it again, like I said, I try to emphasize the things that we agree on. Uh, that would be the principle I think behind the 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 phraseology and the terminology we read in uh, in the New Testament about being being children of Abraham. Or people of faith. That's the that's the idea, right? So, in one sense, people in the church age are children of Abraham. Yeah, yeah. And so, I'm gonna think about this a minute, Aaron. You know, um, <clears throat> was Abraham the father only of Israel? And the answer is no. He had another notable son. Ishmael, right? Yeah. And so uh, is it possible for an Ishmaelite to be a child of Abraham? And the answer is yes. And how would they do that? By slipping over into the nation of Israel and fulfilling the Mosaic law? Well, we know, obviously, from Israel's history, and from what Romans teaches or what Galatians teaches, nobody can fulfill the law. So that's not going to cut it. The only thing that would make an Ishmaelite 
a true son of Abraham, in the biblical sense of that term, is to find a righteousness that comes by faith. And when God said to Abraham, all of the nations of the world are going to be blessed by you. Uh, that, I believe, that is because of the promise of his seed bringing redemption to humanity. The, that's the Lord Jesus, obviously. So my faith isn't in Judaism. It's not in trying to fulfill the Mosaic law, again, like Hebrews and Galatians clearly point out and Romans points out. My my salvation is achieved through the person and work of Jesus Christ and by faith in that and then walking in conformity with him as Savior and Lord. That's true for a Jew. That's true for a Gentile. That's true for uh, for Isaac and company. And that's true for Ishmael and company. So uh, I guess that's how I would maybe nuance that a little bit. So you would say that, and, and I, I would say that people in the Old Testament were saved in the same way as the people in the New Testament, by grace, through faith, in Christ alone. Uh, yes. You would agree with that, I assume? Absolutely. There is no other way. Acts 4.12. There is no other name given under heaven among men whereby we, whereby we must be saved. It is only the person and the work of Jesus Christ. And... I know you know this. I'm not again. I'm saying this for the sake of the people who will be watching yeah, the watching absolutely. this. That why did God give the law in the first place? So what? Why did God pick out this group of people who were really nothing? I mean, when you stop and think of the the world scene at that time, I mean, they're nothing. They're nobody. Why did He pick them out? He picked them out as an act of His grace because they deserved it. Well. And I think we've all all come to understand that the, the nation of Israel kind of thought they were special. You know, hey, look at us. Well, it had nothing to do with you guys. And it had only to do with the grace of God. And there, there are a lot, like Paul makes it clear, just because you got yourself circumcised doesn't mean your heart's circumcised. A circumcision of the heart is far more critical than a circumcision of the flesh. And so this goes back to the principle that we're talking about. Faith in the person and the work of Jesus Christ that leads us to the work of justification and sanctification and eventually glorification is all by God's grace. It always has been. It's never going to be different. So Old Testament, New Testament, that's what it's all about. Yes. Okay. I am, uh, I'm really really glad that, that uh to hear to hear you say that and and that's that's cool that we can be on the same page about that um we've uh we've been talking for about an hour already um it seems it seems uh a lot shorter than that yeah, it's um, flown by. But, yeah i didn't even i didn't even pay attention to the time yeah uh, um, but uh no and uh i would uh, if we had all day i would love to um, ask you a lot more follow-up questions about a lot of these things, but, um, but, uh, yeah, what, uh, do you have any closing, closing thoughts or, or comments for us? Well, I do think Aaron, the, the great, the great truth, I'm just going to grab my Bible here a minute. Can we read in Ephesians 4? Is what I'd like to leave everybody with. Excellent. Uh, this is what Paul said to the Ephesians and to us as we uh, identify ourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ through faith and as we identify ourselves with the people of God, like we talked about, that diverse body that is one. Therefore, I, the prisoner of the Lord, urge you to live worthy of the calling you have received. Again, the worthiness is who Jesus is, the work that he's done, and to be mindful of that. Not my denominational niche, not my particular traditional uh, experience. Those things are important, they're valuable, they're wonderful, and I'm not disparaging any of that. But when Paul says this, he's not talking about those things. He's talking about the person and the work of Christ. 
Therefore, I, the prison, I, therefore, I, the prisoner of the Lord, urge you to live worthy of the calling you have received with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope at your calling, one Lord, one faith one baptism, one God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in all. That is what we need to keep in mind. That is what we need to remember. The, the discussions about doctrinal differences are valuable and important. But when we stop and narrow it down to what is essential, there it is. There it is, and that's what we need to focus on. I would encourage everybody to remember to keep the main thing a main thing. And that's why I'm I'm glad that you accepted the invitation because uh, I I knew that we would have a good conversation that we could honestly uh, discuss similarities and differences without without any condescension or mm -hmm. or anything like that, um, and uh, and just have a good conversation. Um, thank you, Jonathan. Well, you're and, welcome. Uh, it's been my honor. It's been a privilege to talk with you again, Aaron. Yeah. And it's, I, I've enjoyed it and, uh, it's good to be brothers in Christ. Amen.